Greetings, I'm Tony Arend, and we are here for SFS Online and On Topic. This webinar series brings in distinguished members of the School of Foreign Service faculty and alums to talk about the most critical issues of our day. It's produced by the Georgetown University Alumni Association in collaboration with the Walsh School of Foreign Service. Well, today is a very special treat to be able to bring in my friend and colleague, Ambassador Robert Gallucci. Ambassador Gallucci's topic today will be nuclear weapons and security, celebrating, commemorating the 75th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. As everyone knows, in August of 1945, the United States dropped nuclear weapons first on Hiroshima and then on Nagasaki, fundamentally changing international affairs. Now, Ambassador Gallucci is known to most people out there. He served as Dean of the Walsh School of Foreign Service. He served as president of the MacArthur Foundation and had a very long storied career in diplomacy. Serving in numerous capacities, he was Assistant Secretary of State for Political Military Affairs. He negotiated with Iran, he negotiated with Iraq. And the third prong, if you will, of that axis of evil, as it was once called, he negotiated with North Korea and is perhaps most remembered for negotiating the 1994 agreed framework with North Korea. When Ambassador Gallucci finished his time with the MacArthur Foundation, we were honored to have him come back to Georgetown and teach about nuclear weapons. Now, in today's world, nuclear weapons are something that people don't think about as much as they should, and indeed, they should. So I'm gonna turn it over to Ambassador Gallucci, and I would note that Ambassador Gallucci is one of the very best, in addition to his diplomatic career, one of the very best teachers we have at Georgetown. So I'm gonna turn it over to Ambassador Gallucci to talk a little bit about the issue at hand, and then we're gonna open it up to questions. And I would encourage you to use the question format in your control panel, put your questions in there, and then I will then relay them to Ambassador Gallucci. So, ladies and gentlemen, I will turn it over to you, Bob Gallucci. Tony, thank you. I, I may yet employ you to introduce me to my kids. I, 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 I would appreciate that. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I would love to say it's a pleasure to be with you, but of course I'm not with you. But I am happy that I have an opportunity to, to speak with you and maybe we can get some good discussion going uh, after I finish some opening remarks. So the first thing, of course, is the subject of nuclear weapons and why nuclear weapons and why now? Uh, nuclear weapons are different, I think is a, is a pretty easy sentence and it's, that could be the one takeaway if, if, if no other. Nuclear weapons are different. There is nothing that man produces that kills more people as quickly as a nuclear weapon. There's nothing man-made that kills more people as quickly as a nuclear weapon. To get orders of magnitude here, we are suffering through a pandemic in, around, in the world and in the United States. In the United States, COVID-19, by the estimate Johns Hopkins University, so it must be true, the estimate of November 10th uh, or 9th was that virus had killed about a quarter of a million Americans. 225,000 Americans have died. Interestingly, in a depressing sort of way, if you looked at how many people were killed by the two bombs that Tony just mentioned, the one dropped on Hiroshima and the one dropped on Nagasaki, um, after about four months, you could say that those two bombs killed almost exactly the same number of people. The number they use is 226,000. Right, we have been using 225,000 for COVID-19. So 10 months for the virus, three, four months for nuclear weapons. But another figure is after about two to three seconds, 
those weapons killed over 100,000 people. So that's the prompt effects and then the slightly more long lasting effects. So for both reasons of public policy and simple morality, we ought to look closely at nuclear weapons and certainly remember that they're still out there and we're still managing them. The average yield of a nuclear weapon in the American inventory right now, and I did this myself, so I might have it slightly wrong, but it is about 20 times uh, the size of the larger of the two bombs, the one we dropped on Nagasaki. So that's the average. So we have much bigger ones and we have much, much smaller ones. And that's about, the average size is about 400 kilotons of, or 400,000 tons of TNT equivalent. To understand where we are with managing the nuclear weapons issue in the world today, it's, it's worth a look back. And I, I'd almost like to say, you really can't understand where we are now without looking back. Looking back means a sentence like this, which you may find attractive or not. Um, for 70 years, the last 70 years, the United States of America has essentially been defenseless against nuclear weapons. Let me say that again. For the last 70 years, we, the United States of America, have been defenseless against nuclear weapons. I mean something pretty specific by that. I mean that if you take defense to mean defense by denial, the capability to deny an enemy access to your sovereign territory, we have not been able to do that for nuclear weapons since the dawn of the nuclear age. We were able to, and we can contrast this, if you took the period beginning, let's say, 1814, 1815, about when the British were rude enough to burn Washington down, and you count it up until the beginning of um, the end of Second World War, that's about 135 years in which the United States could mount a serious defense, and defense meaning, as a strategist would rigorously, defense by denial. We had uh, non-threatening neighbors to the north and the south, and we had oceans on the east and the west, a pretty competent navy, so we could defend continental United States. But after the United States develops and gives the world nuclear weapons, the Germans actually with the V2, not the V1, but the V2, gives the world a true ballistic missile. You put these two things together, one missile with one warhead destroys one city, and all of a sudden, we are defenseless. We couldn't do anything about ballistic missiles in 1950, and we can't really do anything about ballistic missiles in 2020. Now, some of you may want to quibble with me on that, and I'm prepared to engage you, but for now, just as lawyers like to say, stipulate that so I can continue with this and, and we'll, we'll go on. So not having any defense, we did the next best thing. We developed another concept and that concept was deterrence. And deterrence was interesting and appropriate because unlike defense, it didn't require any physical capabilities. It required psychological impact. Defense, it really is a physical concept. Think of our conventional forces, our, our tanks, our airplanes, our ships. These actually, they're physical and their defense actually creates defense by denial. But deterrence really means punishment. And it is the promise of punishment that creates deterrence. Deterrence actually requires that an adversary believe essentially two things. One is that we are the one doing the deterring here, that we will in fact retaliate. In other words, retaliation is credible. The second thing is that, um, in terms of capability, the second thing is that we have the will to retaliate. So we must have capability. He must believe we have capability, is a better way of saying it, must believe we have the will to retaliate. If we have the capability and he can't take it away, the adversary that is, then we have what the strategist calls survivable retaliatory forces. Survivable retaliatory forces. 
And those forces must be able to cause a potential adversary what the adversary would consider unacceptable damage. So if an adversary is thinking of attacking and believes the target of his attack has the capability to retaliate after he attacks and has the will to do it, then he may be deterred. That, that's how deterrence works. So when you think about this, um, you are thinking about what is essentially at the core of the American nuclear establishment and the Russian, formerly the Soviet establishment. Why do we have a triad? Why do we have ICBMs and missile silos? Uh, why do we, and also uh, submarine launch ballistic missiles on submarines at sea, and also bombers with air launch cruise missiles and gravity bombs? Why do we have a triad, three legs? Well, it's to make sure that we are persuasive, that we can make any potential attacker believe that no matter what he does, we will have survivable forces that can cause him unacceptable damage. It's at the heart of the triad, this concept of deterrence. It's at the heart of arms, arms races. I mean, why is it that at the height of the Cold War, the number of nuclear weapons possessed by the Soviet Union and the United States is estimated at about 60,000 nuclear and thermonuclear weapons, 60,000. Now, why, why would we, that is, I mean, that's substantially beyond what we used to call overkill. That's more than overkill. Why would we do that? It's because it's a psychological concept. There's no necessary force sizing here. We wanna make really, really sure that the other side doesn't think its next increment of offense will take away our retaliatory capability. So we build more retaliatory capability and we try to make it more survivable. It's also this concept of deterrence thought of this way is what's behind arms control. Remember SALT and START, New START, and all those arms control agreements aimed at strategic nuclear weapons. The purpose was to get down to lowest levels where you could go to and have a stable relationship in which both sides was, were pretty confident that the other side had retaliatory capability. When that happens, they have assured destructive capability. And of course, that acronym we all love, they have mutual assured destruction capability or MAD, uh, which Donald Brennan coined because he didn't like the concept terribly much. But that's what deterrence was based upon. Some other things about deterrence that you should occur to you that um, the value uh, proposition uh, for deterrence is essentially a counterfactual. The value proposition is that if I have a deterrent, um, that means that because of my deterrent, you will not do something. The problem with that is you can never prove a counterfactual. You can't prove you, you, your counterfactuals are all over our lives. They're in negative form and positive form. If John F. Kennedy had lived, we wouldn't have gone into Vietnam. Um, because we have a death penalty in a certain state, less people are murdered. You can't prove that, but you certainly can prove that when deterrence fails, right? When deterrence fails, we all know it. This is a diver's watch. I'm a diver of 50 years, and I claim that watch it deters shark attacks. I've been in shark infested waters and I have never been attacked. So I'm sure my watch is working, maybe. If it fails, I'll be absolutely certain that deterrence has failed. So that's a funny thing about deterrence and its effectiveness. A second thing about deterrence and its effectiveness is that it is psychological, which means that if the enemy does not believe your capability exists, it will not be a deterrent, even if it does exist. Moreover, if your enemy believes your, your capability exists, but it doesn't exist, it can be a deterrent. The question is what is believed? This is not the same with defense. If I plan to defend myself from Tony's attack and I have a real defense, I don't care what he thinks, I'll defend myself. But if I plan to deter him, I have to persuade him. And deterrence is all about persuasion. For about 40 years, of the Cold War, we worried about one thing with this nuclear relationship, 
their 30,000 weapons, our 30,000 weapons, deterrence as the concept. Um, we worried about a Soviet surprise attack. We worried that they would at some point think that when they got up one Monday morning, they could disarm us with a first strike. And that led us to build more and led us to worry more. That's what was behind a lot of the worry of the Cold War. Now, that worry persists. Um, but I would argue to you, along with a lot of other people these days, that it isn't the major concern, or at least it shouldn't be. Let's look at what we're doing these days. We produce an NPR in any administration. By the way, NPR does not mean National Public Radio in this context. It means Nuclear Posture Review. And there was one in the Obama administration, uh, there was one in the Bush administration, and there was one in 2018 uh, in this administration, the Trump administration. And essentially, we were all told that we we're going to be building new ICBMs, essentially new ICBMs, new SSBNs, which are those submarines that carry ballistic missiles. We're going to be building new penetrating bombers to replace the B-2, which is kind of like a flying wing. And we're going to be deploying new air-launched cruise missiles to put in our standoff B-52 bombers. So we're essentially going to build a whole new nuclear force, it's going to cost about a trillion dollars uh, over a decade or so. The Russians have something like an NPR, uh, and it only came out last week. And Lawrence Livermore Labs was nice enough to send me a copy translated. And it turns out they're doing a bunch of things that Putin had addressed. They're building a new ICBM. They're building something called a hypersonic glide vehicle, which is a, a vehicle that is launched by a ballistic missile, but then travels in the atmosphere at very low altitude, very difficult to intercept. And it's a penetrating uh, nuclear weapon. They're building a, most bizarrely for me, a nuclear torpedo called a Poseidon, which they would plan to launch across the Pacific and or the Atlantic Ocean to blow up American targets with thermonuclear weapons on either coast. They're building also a cruise missile, missile that is uh, nuclear powered so that it could stay aloft indefinitely and attack the United States from almost any angle. Putin described all this with view graphs and lots of things like that. And, uh, he's very proud of all these things. And they are all being developed, the, the Russian systems, um, partly in the traditional sense of an arms race between the United States and Russia, but there's a technological edge here. And the edge is this, and this is the policy issue for y'all, for all of us, that they are responding, the Russians I mean now, to an American innovation and that is a renewed enthusiasm in the United States for ballistic missile defense. Now, for those of you who are thinking they would, you would love to have defense more than deterrence, Ronald Reagan thought that, that gave us Star Wars for about a decade. It's a nice idea, uh, uh, sort of. It's a nice idea if it works. If it doesn't work, then it's pernicious. And what we have now is a pernicious technological innovation. We are busy still working on ballistic missile defense technology to defend the United States, which, uh, to put it briefly, doesn't work. Uh, any, any technology to defend the United States and its population that leaks at 50% is not working, right? So the problem with this is, from the Russian perspective, we are building a capability to deny them deterrence. Remember how deterrence works. They must be sure they can deliver a nuclear weapon um, in retaliation should we attack. If we still have an offense and deploy a defense, then their retaliation might not get through. We might conclude it won't get through and therefore be willing to attack them because we now don't believe they have a deterrent. These weapons I just described to you all are designed to penetrate American ballistic missile defense. We are encouraging them in this direction. The second thing we're doing that you may have heard less about is, is trying to develop something that's in the biz commonly called conventional prompt global strike. It used to be simply prompt global strike. And then the idea of de-emphasizing the nuclear aspect of prompt global, global strike became interesting. And so what we did was say, we want to be able to strike any target on the planet 
within an hour with a conventional weapon and destroy that target with unique lethality and precision. Well, what the Russians, and by the way, the Chinese saw in that is an American effort to do two things then. First, deploy a ballistic missile defense so that their retaliation couldn't get through, but attack them with conventional munitions, our own hypersonic glide vehicles, if you will, that would target their strategic forces. So we would launch a conventional attack at their nuclear retaliatory capability, and they'd have no possibility of retaliating against us. This imagery, this that plays right into the theories about why arms races take place, accounts for a lot of the new building that's going on and should be of interest to all of us. You could say for economic reasons, but I would say for strategic reasons, it is more interesting. That's still conceptually the old worry. The new worry these days goes beyond that. And it's, it is that in a way deterrence is not what it's all about anymore. And that is old school thinking. The new school thinking is, to, is that the way we're gonna get ourselves involved in a nuclear war is not gonna be because deterrence fails or someone gets up in the morning and decides I can overcome your, your retaliatory capability. Nah, -uh. the new thinking is, and, it, and Bill Perry captures it. This book came out um, just a few months ago. It's called The Button. And what Perry argues is that deterrence failing is not the issue, blunders are the issue. Or the way Perry puts it, you can't deter a blunder. And he names and categorizes these blunders and they're connected to technological innovation that we are beginning to integrate into our strategic nuclear forces, us and the Russians, and to somewhat lesser degree, the Chinese. So what I'm saying here is, first on Perry's list, uh, from some personal experience, is sole authority. For Perry, and I think it should be for the rest of us, the idea that we have become attracted to, that began really in 1948, that the president of the United States has exclusive authority to release nuclear weapons is one thing. That he would carry around with him or an aide would carry around what's called the football, that little suitcase you have seen and been featured in any number of, of movies, um, so that he can make the decision in the less than 10 minutes he would have why would he have to be doing it in such a hurry? Why the football? Why doesn't he kind of take a long weekend and then do it? Well, the reason is because there's a concern about our retaliatory capability. Suppose our satellites and our other early warning capability tell us that there's an attack, which has happened a number of times through the Cold War. It's all been wrong. But we've seen that with a number of things have caused it, the moon, birds, a computer chip, lots of problems here. But the president is told, you have less than 10 minutes. Usually by the time the president is told, it's down to eight. And this all has to do with, it, with what system is, is, is perceived as attacking us. Is it a submarine that's halfway to the United States or is it an ICBM on Russian territory? But in any case, less than 10 minutes is less than 10 minutes to make a decision about whether we launch weapons. Why would we wanna launch weapons? Well, the answer is that not all of our weapons are survivable. One leg of the triad are Minuteman missiles in hardened silos, which don't count anymore as protecting the missiles. Hardened silos might as well be standing out in the open in the field because the precision of everybody's missiles now is such that with a thermonuclear weapon, none of these missiles survive. So it, what, what the president is being told is if you wish to get the missiles off, you must fire them in the next three minutes. Make a decision. And he can do it, and here's the, the thing, without reference to any other human being. Think about that. I know some of you wanna think about that and this president, but what Perry wants to tell you is, you don't want that with any president. You don't want any president that be confronted with that in the middle of the night and, and make a decision. An oh hell decision is a bad idea. And the idea here is put a chain of command in place. Put the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Secretary of Defense, the Attorney General for Lawful Orders, 
figure something out, but don't leave it on the sole authority. First question. The second one is technological innovation. We are doing a number of things that make this false alarm or computer chip problem a lot worse. We are developing cyber capability to interfere with what's called C-cubed, command, control, and communication. And C-cubed in the world of control of strategic nuclear weapons can be interfered with, we think, with cyber advances. We don't have any arms control to limit either side's um, interest in using cyber weapons to interfere. That's a problem. A second problem is the capability to take down satellites. Satellites turn out to be very important, and we are, the United States, disproportionately dependent on satellites for early warning. So what's called ASAT, or anti-satellite capability, is getting much more sophisticated and much more deadly as directed energy weapons are being developed. So it isn't a kinetic kill in the traditional sense. Um, and that is worrying us because that goes to all, or basically, our early warning capability, as well as a lot of our communication capability. So if you put together a cyber attack and an ASAT attack, uh, we could be substantially handicapped. What that leads to is the third, and that is the problem of persistent surveillance. We are developing various kinds of drones, tiny drones that in fact can loiter, and they can loiter over uh, retaliatory capability, which is designed to hide in order to survive, to make deterrence work. But if you can loiter over those submarines and make them vulnerable, if you can loiter over mobile missiles and make them vulnerable, you can attack those assets and take away a deterrent capability. So put these three things together, uh, this possibility of, of uh, persistence, persistent loitering of ASAT, of cyber attack, and then that leads you with the urgency, the require for speed, to the fourth element here, and that's artificial intelligence. The idea here is that we will be introducing artificial intelligence into the loop for our current policy, which you may know exists or not, and that is launch on warning. Our, the policy of the United States of America is to respond to the warning of an attack by the launching of at least our vulnerable systems. And those are the Minutemen, the 425 Minuteman missiles, I believe we have right now. So if the innovation we have here is to bring in AI and take the human individual out of the loop, then technology will determine whether we'll continue to exist or not. That, Perry argues, quite persuasively, is not a good place to be. And we are moving very quickly in that direction. All of this is open to any administration's work. There, there's prescription one can have all along that involves arms control to do something about this. But at this moment, um, if I were gonna choose about where we are most vulnerable, I would tend to agree with Bill Perry that the threat really comes from this new technologies, including the uh, ballistic missile uh, enthusiasm, and our prompt global strike capability, plus these uh, other technologies that squish down the time available for decision making to, uh, to make it more likely that we would get into a war uh, with Russia or China as a result of a blunder than the failure of deterrence. I haven't said a word about nuclear terrorism. I haven't said a word about North Korea or Iran or the proliferation of nuclear weapons because I wanted to get your attention on our strategic nuclear weapons and the decisions that we have to make there. But for our discussion, I'll go wherever you want us to. Thanks very much for your attention. I appreciate it. Bob, thank you. And we, we do have a lot of questions focusing on, on those areas. And, and let me say, I've, I've heard you speak uh, about the challenge of nuclear weapons really since you came to Georgetown. And it's always sobering. It's always scary but I've always felt it's something that people need to hear because people aren't thinking about nuclear weapons, at least in the post-Cold War world and the post-9-11 world. Well, here, here's a question, 
and, and this is, uh, you had occasion to work and interact with now President-elect Biden. You were talking about the NPR that came out during the Trump administration and previous ones. Do you see, and, and this is asking you to predict the future, do you see any sort of change in with a new administration coming in as to how the United States might conceptualize both nuclear strategy and arms control? There will be people in the Biden administration who want to make some fundamental changes. They will have a hard time doing it. There is a nuclear weapons establishment in the United States, uh, as there is in Russia and China, but in the United States, that will resist change. At the end of the Obama administration, the Washington Post reported that there was discussion in some quarters of the US, United States of America adopting a policy of no first use of nuclear weapons. Um, that's a, a pretty interesting thing to do. It is to say that we will reserve nuclear weapons for one purpose. It's sometimes called the sole purpose, to deter an attack by another country on us with nuclear weapons. Okay? There are implications if you do that. Right now, if you look at the, we, that's not our policy now. We, we, we might decide to use nuclear weapons if there's any kind of threat. But that's the kind of thing it, which brought out the strategic establishment in Washington uh, and elsewhere to argue that that would be catastrophic for our alliance and our extended deterrence. It would be bad policy. Uh, it was soft-headed thinking. A, a lot of these kind of critiques. Uh, what I would say is there... I think will be because of the technological innovation going on, there will be enthusiasm even among the cognoscenti to, to engage in arms control with the, with the Russians. So I, I, I would predict that while we will only have like three weeks between the inauguration of Biden and the expiration of the New START Treaty, that in those three weeks, <laughs> Biden will re-up the treaty for another five years. I mean, that's not the way this should be done, but I think that's the way it will happen. And that'll be a good thing. And I think he will explore other things, but I, I'm not optimistic that those of us who think in terms of arms control, ways of managing this threat, so we don't get ourselves into a situation in which even if it's not intended, we end up killing uh, millions of people. I mean, this is what, you're quite right, what I want from an audience is to understand, you know, we still, are deploying about a tenth of what we did. We are uh, maybe maybe 20%. If you took the United States and Russia right now, we have over 90% of the world's nuclear weapons, probably close to 95%. And that number is, if it was 60,000, now it's probably closer to 10,000. Uh, but it's that's still a lot of nuclear weapons. So here, here's a question, and this is from uh, two people that we both know, uh, Peter Lee and Bill Licamelli. And I'm going to ask it together as kind of a joint question, it relates to North Korea. So the question, as I would think of it is, one, what do you believe North Korea's current nuclear capabilities are? Two, do you see the Biden administration changing its approach to North Korea? And then three, how do you think Kim Jong-un and North Korea will view a Biden administration? I mean, I'm not sure there are going to be love letters written, for example. So in terms of what North, North Korea capability is in the nuclear weapons area, most estimates have them between 30 and 50 nuclear weapons, 30 and 50. But producing fissile material, both separating plutonium and enriching uranium to high levels, so that they probably are producing um, five to 10 nuclear weapons a year in addition. So they are at the low end of the scale of nuclear weapon states, uh, first. Second, they, in terms of delivery capability, they have a substantial delivery capability short range uh, against uh, targets in Northeast Asia. But their long range capability, the ability to reach the United States of America with a ballistic missile, is uh, open to question. Uh, open to question, but not nothing. In other words, if we're going to worry about something, uh, what I would worry about is that someday uh, Kim Jong-un gets up and believes the United States has launched an effort at regime change. 
because I think if that were to happen, um, he might test those uh, two ballistic missiles he has. Uh, one one of, would reach the, the northwest part of the United States. The other would re cover the whole United States. Never been tested at range, only at altitude. Never been tested with uh, to assure themselves that their nuclear weapon would survive reentry. So lots of ifs in that. But we are potentially vulnerable to a true thermonuclear weapon from North Korea. What I'm saying is I think it likely the last test they conducted, which yielded around 400 kilotons, was probably a real thermonuclear weapon. So we, we got an adversary there with nuclear weapons, and they tend to go mobile. They tend to hide stuff. So we couldn't be sure of taking out that capability if we wished. First question. Second question, um, I hope that President Biden will launch a policy review. That's typically what happens. I've been in the front end of administ more administrations than I would care to admit to, but you do policy reviews on important issues. And I think North Korea deserves one. And I hope in the course of that, there would be a conclusion that as exciting as symmetry was, uh, it's not the way to go. Um, I spent a year and a half talking to the North Koreans before I could sign what was called the Agreed Framework. It was in place for about eight years. But these guys, when they go to the negotiating table, it's not a negotiating table, it's a lunch table. They're there for lunch, right? And they're gonna try to do a deal that's gonna cover nuclear weapons and all kinds of other military capability in Northeast Asia. It's ridiculous. It seems to me. So I would like to see the Biden administration change the process. When it comes to substance, I, I think that we should have learned that the North Koreans will put serious capability on the table, but they want serious performance on our part. They want us to take some steps, political steps, that move us towards normalizing relations, beginning with removal of sanctions. Well, we can get into an argument of what do they have to do to get us to remove all the sanctions. All right. The question is, is this worth, you know, is the, is the game worth the candle? And for me, it would be. In other words, I, for, the, for the Obama administration, it wasn't. I mean, we had at the end something called strategic patience. Do you remember that? I mean, those were two perfectly good words put together to make a really crappy phrase, right? So I don't know what strategic patience means, but it essentially means containment. We're not going to do anything because we don't think they will, in fact, make a deal. We have to, I think, get to a point where we will have something to talk about. And I think that's possible. I'm, I remain optimistic about the possibility of serious negotiation. Very good. Uh, let's, let's hope so. Uh, connected to that, uh, John Barham asks a question. Traditionally, arms control agreements have been concluded as treaties. There are some exceptions, and the so-called Iran agreement, the JCPOA, was not done as a treaty. But if you think of, of START and you think of SALT, they were all done at INF, they were all done as treaties. And so this is really a question. Do you think that the treaty format is the way to go, especially given the reluctance of the current Senate to approve a whole host of treaties, including the Law of the Sea Treaty, or would there be another path to meaningful arms control? I, if I thought, if we were sitting around the table in the, in the new Biden administration, I think that the, the, a good sentence would be, if we could get a treaty, we should go for one, right? I wouldn't, I wouldn't make the treaty, the, the failure to get a treaty uh, to lead us to the conclusion negotiations weren't worthwhile. Uh, I mean, the agreed framework was not a treaty with North Korea. It was a framework, right? So you can accomplish some stuff uh, without it being a treaty, but there are advantages to a treaty, not the least of which is you've demonstrated that you got the Senate aboard. Uh, and it's it's probably worth um, the effort that goes in to get the Senate aboard, uh, if you can, because you I think you get additional durability uh, and you get uh, other people to become part of the domestic consensus in support of the treaty. So I, I would like to see arms control treaties, but I, I wouldn't make that the requirement of an arrangement. One of the advantages that a President Biden would have is having been chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, 
he would be very well versed in how the process works and a lot of the politics involved. So there, there might be more of a possibility than with a president who's sort of unfamiliar with that process. Uh, so one of our former students, uh, Bob, Doug Shaw, uh, asked a question. Uh, he's talking about a uh, greater than $100 billion replacement of the U, uh, US ICBM forces underway without a competitive bidding process. Uh, is that the right path forward for the U.S. ICBM forces? Look at Doug. Uh, my my view here is the more interesting question is whether we should be keeping the ICBM force. I mean, I'm I'm not uh, uh, much of an expert on defense contracting, uh, so I don't I don't know how, in fact, to to answer your question. I think you could probably do much better than I could, but I do know that uh, serious strategists like like a Bill Perry. Uh, question the desirability of having an ICBM force, which is in a use or lose posture. I mean, our, our bombers, in the best cases, can get airborne. Our submarines, we truly believe, cannot be tracked by the Russians and certainly not by the Chinese. It's only the ICBM force which is use or lose. And the question is, how wise is it to have a force like that? One of the crazier arguments I have heard for the ICBM force is that it's a missile sink and, and the, it would force an attacker to attack all those aim points and have all those detonations on American soil in order to take out the ICBMs. That does not seem to me uh, like a, a very good argument for keeping that leg of the triad. It, the first thing I would do is not be to get rid of a leg of the triad, by the way, but since you brought up the I, ICBMs and the modernization, I mean, I'm for modernization if it's going to do it, which is truly just modernization to make them safe and effective. Um, but the, what we're doing to the ICBM force is different than what we're doing uh, with, to the other legs of the triad. The SSBNs are going to be new boats. Um, the new bombers are going to be new bombers. It's not going to be a, a revised version of the B-2. So we are, we're deploying new systems in, in the other areas, uh, delivery vehicles, uh, and we are uh, modernizing uh, the ICBM force, at least as I understand it. Thank, thanks, Bob. Uh, I, I'm going to ask a specific question. I'm going to ask one more a general question. Specific question is the Biden administration has indicated that it is going to try to re-adhere to uh, the JCPOA. So the JCPOA for everyone was the, the so-called Iran agreement. Uh, do you think that's going to happen and do you think it's a good idea? Uh, yes and yes. Um, I th I think that uh, Biden was fully aboard uh, eventually to the uh, JCPOA, uh, and uh, interestingly, uh, if you took two the two pieces of JCPOA, those that those the pieces that limit um, the amount of uh, material they can produce, the number of centrifuges, and all that stuff, and the other provisions which go to verification, um, the well, they have, the Iranians have nibbled at the capability side. On verification, they've been pretty compliant. Not perfectly, but pretty compliant. And the verification is worth a great deal to us. And so I, I would think, yes, we want to go back to the JCPOA. Would I look for thing, areas of improvement in a JCPOA? Yes. I mean, the expiration dates, for example, on some of the limits strike me. And actually, there are some issues in verification in which I'd like to have access that's a little quicker than provided under the current arrangements. But at the end of the day, if I couldn't get any of that, would I take the JCPOA as it was? Yes, I would. I, I, I didn't think it was a perfect deal, but as the standard goes on these things, it was better than nothing. Kind of like Zoom. <laughs> Makes sense. So I've got one final question, and, and I'll begin with the, the preface. I know that Neither you, Bob, nor I are experts on the Vatican and the Pope. So we'll, we'll stipulate that, that one. But it's Please. a question from, uh, from Mary Jane Pagan. I think it's a good question. Uh, we may not be able to answer it, but do, do you see any influence of Pope Francis and his recent encyclical, encyclical which kind of talks a little bit differently about the possibility of a just war? Do you see that influence? as affecting the Biden administration, strategic thinking, or conceptualizations about warfare? 
I, I, this is a, a little known piece of history I'm going to share with you now. But um, about a year and a half ago, I was invited to the Vatican for a uh, symposium, international symposium, uh, on technology and security. It was held at the Jesuit residence in the, in the Vatican. Um, we had an audience with the Pope. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if someone wrote his talking points, but they were pretty intelligent and interesting on technological innovation and the human condition. And I was asked to speak about the kind of stuff I talked about today, what we were doing with our nuclear weapons these days. And also on, my, on the panel, there are two other people. One uh, came from NATO and the other was a woman who worked on Russian strategic nuclear weapons. Mm. And she was most critical of the uh, Putin's decisions on nuclear weapons, which struck me as exciting that she would do that. I didn't think I needed to worry so much. Um, I was critical as well, but I, I raised that because I get to tell you that I was at the Vatican, but also uh, because that someone got the Pope's attention and uh, and made the case to him that it was a good idea if he put his toe in this water. Now, I don't know if anything came of any of that uh, afterwards. Uh, there was not that I know of much follow up. But it was a, it was an interesting thing that the Pope directly got involved in the question of new technologies and the human condition and what impact they would have. And so the, we were doing cyber, we were doing all kinds of the people there at this symposium. Um, I, I think that uh, many of us remember the days of, of the bishops encyclical, I think mm -hmm. it was, and that was a time when the Catholic Church got deep into um, questions of nuclear weapons and just war, etc. cetera. Um, I like to think that the time hasn't passed for that. Uh, that is still a relevant thing for the Catholic Church uh, and something they could usefully address. Our, our friend uh, and former colleague Brian Hare was uh, intimately involved in authoring mm -hmm. that, uh, that Catholic bishop's pastoral, as, as, as I recall, too. Well, it will be very interesting to see because the, the, the encyclical is, it doesn't say just war theory is no more, but it's very skeptical of the applicability of just war theory in part in an age with the modern technology that we have. So it'll be very interesting to see. And it will also be interesting to see, and uh, I think what the, the question was, was, was getting at too, is whether Biden's experience and his understanding of Catholic doctrine will affect his conceptualization of, of just war and on the, of the use of, of, of weapons. Uh, but we, we, shall, we shall see. Right. Well, Bob, I hate to say it, uh, we're out of time, but let me, let me ask if you have any sort of final words of wisdom before we formally close. Yes, everybody write your congressman, tell them we want new start, re-up for another five years. Here, here, could could not agree. Not to be that isn't partisan, but I, I couldn't agree more. I think that's an excellent, an excellent recommendation. Uh, Bob, I want to thank you again very much, and uh, all our viewers out there, thank Ambassador Gallucci for an outstanding uh, presentation. We hope to have you back, perhaps in the new administration. It would be great to do this maybe in in March or June of next year, and you could revisit some of the things that have been implemented by the Biden administration. As they say, it would be my honor. Well, we would be honored. Uh, well, thank Ambassador Gallucci. We also want to thank Kelly Young from the Georgetown University Alumni Association for arranging everything. And a very special thanks to Eleanor Monty Jones. It was her idea to come up with SFS online and on topic. And we will see you all next time. Thanks to all of you.